Now, new figures show that the UK houses so many asylum seekers that nearly a third of our aid budget is going, being spent on uh, people, asylum seekers living here. And with, with me now is Dr Tamsin Barton from the Independent Commission for Aid Impact. Dr Barton, why is it, why is it that, we're, that this kind, our government's allowed to spend aid money here? So the UK, along with other donors that belong to the OECD think tank, uh, development Assistance Committee is allowed to spend money, which counts as humanitarian spend, in the country that they're paying from or other countries mm. where refugees are housed. That, that's allowed in the rules, uh, but it isn't counted by everybody. In fact, the UK used not to count this until 2010, where it changed its position. But the reason it's come to the fore now is because that spend has increased so much. Mm. So 28% is a lot, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's 4.3 billion, as you say in your report. So it's actually even more than last year. So we were expecting that it would go down a bit. Last year it was 3.7 billion, and we were told that was because there were so many people coming from Ukraine, mm. there were people coming from Afghanistan, and it can only be charged to the aid budget for the first year. So mm. you'd expect the cost to go down if it was about Ukraine and Afghanistan. But clearly that wasn't the main driver of the cost. What you're still seeing is very high costs of accommodation for asylum seekers mm. and refugees. So the failure of the Home Office to deal with the small boats crisis, possibly, means that we're spending aid money here when it should be helping people who need it in poorer countries. Well, it's obviously much more equitable to provide that aid where it's mm. needed the most, so that it can make the most difference. But the other thing that we don't like about <laughs> it and why we've criticised it as being inefficient is... Thinking about the taxpayer more broadly, not just in relation to the aid budget. So in this strange setup where they have to manage to hit this aid target, like landing the helicopter yeah. on the handkerchief, yeah. the foreign That's office... That's 0.5% of GDP. Exactly. That's They're the aiming at 0.5. The, the, the way it works is that the foreign office is the spender and saver of last resort. And that's because it has the ability to move funds across financial and calendar years for various reasons I could go into, <laughs> and the other departments don't. But that poses a massive problem if it means that the Home Office, which is mostly, it's about more than two-thirds of these costs, is able to spend as much as it likes without any impact on its own budget. Now, that's completely against the normal way in which government... So the Home Office has no, no... doesn't really require to bring down the hotel's bill because it's not their bill. It's paid for by the Foreign Office. That's how it ends up working. Now, <laughs> we, you know, we realise it's not that the Home Office is trying to waste no. money, but it's not the right incentives. They're not feeling that pain in their pockets. It's someone else's money, would. and you know how Whitehall works. Not my budget, Governor. So that, that is something that clearly just isn't a sensible mm. way to manage a budget. So that's no. where we feel that having a target managed in this way makes no sense. Anyway, what it's led to is a situation where the incentives for the Home Office are more to respond in the short term. So there's a lot of criticism, so they will try and find alternative mm. sites to reduce costs, but they do not focus on a long-term solution to get away from this crisis, because for the long term, the way you can reduce these costs for the taxpayer in general is that you need to have cheaper accommodation, which is more suited to people who need to be living in the community in flats and in houses like they used to before COVID when they started being put in hotels. But is it right, though, that we're spending aid money on poor people who are arriving here from overseas? So is it in better value for taxpayer, given that 0.5% you know, of, our, of our national income is given over to helping those much less fortunate than ourselves? If they're in the UK, that's fine, because they, you know, we're helping them, aren't we, wherever they are? Well, we'd certainly agree with the principle of humanitarianism that nobody should be left destitute without you know, the basics of shelter, food, etc. But spending the money this way mm. is not the best use of taxpayers' money because, it, in effect, what you're ending up doing more is subsidising hotels than actually providing humanitarian services. Now, the target was 0.7%, wasn't it? And, of course, that period you mentioned there went up to about 20 0.7% became law, I think, in 2014. It's now down to 0.5%. Yes. We're, we've now gone past the end of the financial year. What was the amount of our, of our GDP spent on aid in the last financial year? Well, just to be confusing, the OECD DAC measures by calendar year. I know. Yes. <laughs> and that doesn't always fit with the way budgets work. And that is why, in actual fact, in this year, it's ended up being 0.58. So it's in which nearer year? to 0. The financial 6. year. 2023, the year that we're looking at. The calendar at, year. The calendar year. It was 0.58. It was 0.58, and that is because the Treasury 
What they, when they saw in 2022 that the Foreign Office basically had to pause its entire aid spending. So it didn't have money when the Pakistan floods happened, mm. for example, and they weren't able to pay where they, where they legally had to pay. They realised that they needed to provide some extra. So what they did was they provided an extra £2.5 billion pounds over two financial years. Right. <laughs> and the way that ended up, so they were thinking, well have it a maximum of 0.55. Is that a buffer then, basically? It's a buffer, and actually we have suggested that this, if they're going to have this target, <laughs> it's much better not to try and be so yes. exact. That leads to more it's value like, for money. It's a landing helicopter on a, on a moving, moving vessel. As... You'll spend money on unnecessarily one year. You know, you're going to yeah. be overspending, and then you could be underspending but when you need to be 0. spending. 0.58 is a huge overspend of it on the aid budget. Well, over the two years, it probably would have ended, because it was 0.51 in the previous It's still year. over 0.5. I mean... It's over 0.5. And For two years running. It is over 0.5, but then there's back to the question. Most people don't think the aid budget is being spent on people seeking asylum here no. or refugees. So actually, you've got such a huge chunk, 28%, that's where it's being spent. Yeah. So then we certainly don't take a position, you know, that's for, that's for politicians and ultimately people voting for them to decide where the money should be spent. Our job is just to scrutinise how the aid budget is spent. Is it good value for money? Is it reaching the people that need it the most? And what's your view on the aid budget generally? It has been criticised, hasn't it, by some newspapers for spending money on frivolous schemes? Well, we don't have a, a view as such on it in general, but we review it. We provide reports, maybe eight a year, to the International Development Committee in Parliament. And what we do for our sort of most thorough reviews, we score them. Ah. And to give you a sort of quick snapshot, a little bit less than two-thirds we view as broadly satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the way I can give you the sort of highest level picture. So a third are not satisfactory. <laughs> so a third are, we have, have very concerning features, but some positives. Yes. So that's what we call an amber, amber red score, we give it. And what we've done in this case, actually, we, we, had a, we had a review which didn't have a score because it was what we call a rapid review, but we have scored the follow-up process. So this is a year on from our review. We gave yes. them recommendations. They rejected two of them, which is unusual. But yeah. of the four that were left, we looked as hard as we could for improvements. There were some. They have improved a little bit their contract management, but ultimately they haven't done the big things that make a difference. But just going back to this, the 28% of, of, of the foreign aid budget spent in the UK, we're not going to get wrapped on the knuckles by the UN. No, not as such, but the chair, I was on, on an event with him recently, the chair of the OECD, DAC, has made some comments in what's called the peer review, mm. which is basically encouraging the government to look at why it is in the UK last year, it was twice as much as a percentage of the average of DAC donors. Well, we think, based on our report, that they're counting everything that you could possibly <laughs> imagine you could charge to the aid budget. That's mm. why it's so much of it. Listen, Dr Barton, it's great to chat, chat through the aid budget and understand why that money's been spent here. Thank you for coming to the studio and joining us tonight. Thank you.